Okay, welcome to today's webinar in our series on the future of AI in education and training. I'm Lewis Johnson, the host of the overall series. Uh, I'm very pleased to have with me today Kurt Van Lane, who will be um, moderating the discussion. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about some of the things that we've learned over the course of this series about the role of AI in uh, education and training. Uh, the seven roles that uh, that it can play, which I call the Magnificent Seven. And we'll talk a little bit about the road ahead for, uh, uh, for AI in this area. So I want to thank uh, MGM Studios. Uh, I mine their archives for uh, images from their various tellings of the story of the Magnificent Seven uh, to help tell my story here. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Magnificent 12, uh, the presenters uh, through the series so far, who've uh, contributed a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be talking about today. And I'm going to be drawing a lot on uh, examples of their work in this presentation. So as we s noted at the start of the series, there's a lot of interest in the potential for AI in, uh, in education and curiosity as to what role it might play in the future. There are some who have claimed that actually intelligent, intelligent machines could take the place of teachers in the future and not too many years from now. Uh, and some uh, big foundations have been investing a lot of money in AI, looking at its potential to fix education. For example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, and they've been looking particularly at personalized learning as uh, something that can fix education, that can change schools. But at the same time, we see there's been um, some backlash against personalized learning. Uh, there's been some recent um, comments in the, in the press about this. And if you look at the comments that uh, students and teachers are making about this, there are some common uh, themes that appear. So, so one area where personalized learning seems to run into trouble is when people take pretty mediocre online learning materials and then personalize it. So personalization can help, but it cannot overcome limitations of the underlying learning materials. Another place where we see personalized learning running into trouble if interaction between students and the personalized software takes the place of interacting with other students or interacting with teachers. So if the software is removing teachers from the, from the picture, that can be a potential problem. Because as studies tell us, teachers matter more to student achievement than any other aspect of schooling. Uh, teachers help learners in a lot of different ways. And uh, a particular application of AI, such as personalized learning, may um, help in some areas, but neglect other areas. So it's important for us to keep in mind from this that there really is no one silver bullet uh, for uh, 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 that AI can serve in this area. Uh, personalized learning can't be a silver bullet. And there aren't other applications that by themselves will fix the problems that we face uh, in education. Uh, but in fact, as we learn from these webinars, there are multiple roles that AI can play. Uh, and we'll talk about seven of them today. Uh, and these can help um, the learning process in a number of different ways not by replacing teachers, but by working alongside them to take on tasks that teachers uh, previously found very time concerning, consuming and burdensome, so that teachers can focus on what they do best to help their students succeed. So what are these seven roles? Uh, the ability to communicate with learners, 
the ability to uh, assess their work, their knowledge and skills, uh, to critique them and provide feedback, to offer guidance as to where they, uh, students should uh, focus their attention, uh, to summarize how those groups of students, say in a class overall, are performing, to identify uh, where students uh, need help, uh, to orchestrate the activities within a classroom, and to construct new learning materials. And we'll talk about each of these in this webinar. So first of all, communicate. By this, I mean the ability to engage in natural human communication, just as human tutors can. And actually, this is an aspect of intelligent tutoring systems from the very beginning. When people first got interested in the potential of AI to help learning, they developed virtual Socratic tutors that you could engage in, in conversations with. And this area has come and gone, but I would say it's now coming back and increasing uh, in importance. So there are two aspects of this. So one is the ability to understand and respond in natural language with a learner, um, and also to recognize the nonverbal aspects of communications, the cues, the indications of emotions, of effort, the thing which uh, teachers and tutors are very good at, but can get lost if you're just uh, relying on a conventional point and click interface uh, to communicate with a learner. And this type of communication capability is important because it can provide insights into the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the learner that are difficult to obtain by other means. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. So on the left is um, an example uh, from AutoTutor developed uh, at the uh, University of Memphis. And this is built on top of the Alex system. And some of you may be familiar with Alex as an example of personalized learning. And what um, the folks at Memphis did is they augmented that with an AutoTutor capability where there's a virtual tutor, you see that on the left, that can engage in a conversation, uh, basically a chat conversation with the learner to probe the learner's knowledge, get the learners to answer questions, to articulate their knowledge uh, on the topic. And also in this case to uh, be able to engage in a side conversation with another virtual character that is acting as a, um, a, another student that uh, the tutor can uh, interact with. On the right, we see an example of some of the work that Beverly Wolf at, at UMass has been doing uh, to use um, computer vision to uh, uh, track a learner's face and in particular track their intention, their emotional state, their boredom, their engagement, to find out, if you will, more of what's going on in the student's head as they are engaging uh, in the interaction. So let's talk particularly about uh, natural language communication here and, and why this is important and uh, important in a range of different uh, areas. So uh, it's, um, you know, we uh, do a lot of work with natural language communication. We teach communication skills but I've been interested to see uh, increasing interest in natural language in uh, math skills, just as we saw. So, so why is this advantageous? Well, if you're engaging learners in a conversation, it promotes learners' initiative and problem solving. So learners then have the freedom to answer questions or to um, answer questions that the virtual tutor is uh, providing to them. This challenges learners to think deeply, uh, to question their assumptions, perhaps uh, reveal misconceptions, uh, while at the same time avoiding prompting and biasing the learner uh, as pre-authored choices uh, ca can do. So uh, a lot of um, conventional online learning makes use of uh, multiple choice exercises. And the problem with multiple choice exercises 
is that learners can often guess which is the right answer uh, without having to think about it too deeply. And this doesn't give much insight of whether the learner would be able to solve the problem if those choices weren't presented. Uh, natural language can also be used to recast and model correct responses. So basically the, the virtual tutor's response can uh, help to uh, present um, uh, the right uh, answer or the right uh, interpretation in the context of conversation. And when you're engaging a learner in conversation, then that provides access to other types of data about the conversation that can be useful to measure progress toward mastery, such as the degree of fluency of, um, of, of the learner's response. How rapid uh, are they? And the degree of, of engagement. And finally, conversational systems can't be engaged easily. It can't be gamed easily. Since the learners have to come up with answers on their own, they can't kind of fake it and uh, let's say by guessing what the answer might be. Now, of course, students are very good at gaming uh, online learning systems, but I think it's generally more difficult in a, um, in a free form communication um, uh, scenario. Another use of AI to promote learning is in assessment. So analyzing learner responses during problem solving. And this is something that we see um, uh, throughout in uh, AI-driven learning systems. Uh, and it also, by the way, complements the communication capability that I was just talking about. So, so one big difference between uh, natural language understanding in say a chat bot for like um, you know ordering tickets online versus um, natural language communication in an educational context is that the system is evaluating the learners responses assessing them and drawing inferences from that of uh, what their knowledge and skills are um, Assessment capabilities are useful for detecting common errors um, and also to measure uh, the fluency, the rapidity of, of learning. As I said, this is a way of, in, of detecting a progress toward mastery. Automated assessment can reduce the burden on teachers to grade homework. And in fact, we see uh, automated assessment playing an important role in online uh, homework uh, uh, these days. Uh, it also can be used to um, basically to generate predictive analytics to predict the learner's future learning journey. Not just assess where they are now, but where they are headed. Are they on track to success or are they likely to run into trouble? And this can be very valuable information for teachers to provide uh, learners appropriate guidance. Uh, so to give an example of how tutorial dialogue works uh, in AutoTutor, so there uh, the AutoTutor asks a question that requires explanatory reasoning on the part of the student. Uh, the student may answer with fragmentary information over multiple dialogue terms. And if so, then the tutor has to keep pumping the student for more information and then analyze those fragments of explanation that the student provides. Uh, it has a list of good idea units that it's looking for in student responses. And it also has a list of expected errors and misconceptions that students might make. And then based upon that, it provides feedback in the course of the subsequent uh, conversation. Now, in the course of that interaction, it's also important for um, AI-driven systems to provide feedback to learners about their performance. And it's important that it be done at the right time and in the right way. So it's not good enough just to 
uh, mark responses are right or wrong. It's important for a system to be able to provide feedback that will uh, be useful for the learners that will motivate them to learn, uh, learn and improve. Uh, to give um, um, bad news if appropriate, but to then encourage learners to continue uh, to work and succeed. So uh, this is what Beverly Wolf refers to as taking the whole student into account, not just their, uh, their cognitive skills, but their emotional state, their motivation, their effort, their self-confidence. And in fact, a key aspect of, uh, or really an indication of success of AI-driven learning systems is their ability to instill self-confidence and motivate learners to succeed, just as teachers try to help their students to, uh, to succeed. So to see a little bit about how this works, again, uh, refer to uh, AutoTutor as an example. So, so here is an uh, AutoTutor question uh, that has been posed. Suppose a boy is in a free-falling elevator and he holds his keys motionless in front of him and he lets go. What will happen to the keys? Um, explain why. Uh, of course, no one's asking here what will happen to the boy in this free-falling elevator, but I guess that's a, a separate matter. Anyhow, we're treating this as a physics question. So, so now the student has to generate a response of what is going to happen to the keys. Are they going to fall? Are they going to be stationary? Are they going to float up? And so then the student generates a response and the gener student needs to be able to explain that response. And then based upon that response, then AutoTutor may come back with um, uh, pumps for more information. Like, I bet you can explain this a bit more. Uh, can ask probing questions. Uh, what about the acceleration of the objects involved? or asking another question that might prompt the student to think in the, in, 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 um, along the right um, direction to a solution. And of course, provi provide encouraging feedback, like great job. So these are all aspects of the um, uh, critiquing capability uh, that an AI-driven system can provide. Let's now look at another example. So this is from the assistment project uh, at uh, Worcester Polytechnic University, led by Neil Heffernan. So, so this is aimed at, um, at, at math, uh, particularly at middle school, where students are, perform are, are doing homework assignments online, and in the process, they get feedback. And let's look at some example. Here's an example of, of the type of feedback that assessments generate. For the student to get tutoring on this problem, they need to type in the common wrong answer. When they click submit, the video will pop up. Looks like you made a mistake on this problem, but here's what I think you did wrong. I think you multiply it on both sides by a negative eight. Unfortunately, that's not gonna get you the correct answer. You've got positive 72. What you should be doing is multiplying on both sides by a positive to get the correct answer. Finish that problem up and you'll have the correct answer. Good luck. So you see this is doing more than simply uh, scoring the, the answer is right or wrong, but, but importantly it's encouraging the learner to keep working so that they ultimately succeed at the problem. So this I think is a key aspect of what we look for in um, a um, um, a um, uh, in a um, critiquing capability for the student to get tutoring on this problem, they need to and type in the common wrong in. answer when they click some. So then, of course, it's not enough just to provide feedback on the exercise. It's also important to, for the uh, system to be able to provide guidance to the learner, to provide advice as to what skills and activities uh, they should work on uh, next. So just as we talk about teachers acting as a guide on the side, 
Uh, it's important for um, AI-driven learning systems to be a guide on the side. Not just to advise on next steps, but also uh, long-term trajectories, what the students should be focusing on um, uh, in the future. Uh, and at the same time, it should respect the learner's own goals and autonomy. And this, by the way, is one place where, um, where um, personalized learning systems can fall short. Uh, many of them simply present the next exercise, say, go work on this next, so that the system is entirely in control of what the learner should be working on. What we find in practice, particularly for um, uh, adult learners or learners in the older uh, in secondary or post-secondary level is that they have particular goals that they want to pursue and they want options, but they want to be able to decide for themselves what will be best for them in order to pursue, you know, to achieve uh, their, um, their learning objectives. So again, this is what a guidance capability needs to be able to uh, uh, provide. So uh, an example of this long-term uh, guidance is the, uh, the MARI Intelligent Mentoring System. And, and, and this is very interesting work because it's, it's collecting data from a number of different sources of learner performance. And then based upon that, uh, looking at what progress the student has made to um, uh, master key competencies and then can provide guidance as to what to work on into in order to further develop those competencies you know skills such as, as de de demonstrating positive work ethic uh, demonstrating integrity integrity demonstrating teamwork skills so these obviously are skills that develop over time and um, can be developed uh, by means of a range of different learning activities, but a system like this can provide learners with overall indication of their progress and where they uh, should focus in order to, uh, to, uh, to succeed ultimately in their careers. Uh, this is what we, this is uh, ultimately aimed at. So those are some of the ways in which AI can support learners. Uh, AI can also support teachers. And, and here are a couple of ways in which uh, it can do that. One is by summarizing uh, the progress of an entire class or even uh, an entire learning program for providing insights uh, regarding, well, what are the patterns of errors across um, uh, the learner population as a whole? Uh, identifying at-risk students within the group that need particular attention. And so this is very interesting because it can help teachers as well as institutions to evaluate how well their uh, the, uh, teaching is doing so they can focus their teaching efforts so that they can uh, teachers can learn from other teachers. So this can start to have a systemic impact on the way teaching is done, above and beyond simply the interaction with the software. So let's look now at an example uh, here from uh, assessments of how classroom instruction uh, utilizes a summary of the performance of the learners. Okay, so we're gonna go over your homework from last night if you wanna get out your sheets. Uh, a couple questions we noticed we did pretty poorly on. First question we're going to look at is this one here. Three to the negative second times three to the negative eight. Common wrong answer was one over nine to the ten. What's wrong with one over nine to ten? Yeah. Why? So let's look at what happened here. So first of all. This summary uh, 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 is provided to the teacher so that when the teacher goes into the class, teacher knows immediately how well the students did, which ones they got right, how much effort they applied. 
that can identify uh, particular exercises where a lot of the students had difficulty, and it reveals common wrong answers. So this, so so given this information, this really can help uh, teachers to focus on on where they should focus uh, within the class, within the within the um, classroom activity, and it serves to make the teaching much more data driven. So very interesting potential of these types of tools to provide insights uh, to teachers. Now, going beyond that, uh, we're starting to see systems that are able to orchestrate uh, learning activities, not just to summarize what happened on the computer outside of class or in the computer lab, but actually to help teachers and students manage uh, activities within the classroom. Uh, to assign students to groups, to work together, to track participation, track progress, to identify students needing attention. And if you have further um, uh, questions about this, or you're curious to, uh, to learn more, I'd like to point you to uh, Kurt Van Lane's webinar on this topic, where he talked a lot about uh, how systems can uh, support learners individually, in groups, and in classes, and where orchestration systems fit within all of that. So in fact, this is an um, example from uh, one of the systems that uh, Kurt's lab has uh, been working on, the FACT system for classroom challenges. So if you look at this, it might look like it's just a class with a bunch of kids that are focusing on their devices. But in fact, what you're seeing here is orchestrated collaborative learning. Uh, the students are sitting together at desks and they're actually working together on a problem, common problem workspace. Their devices are each giving them um, a, a common view to that workspace. Then the teacher has uh, his own tablet that he then uses to monitor what's happening in the class. So he can see from this, uh, see what each of the different uh, groups are doing, can track, track their participation, uh, track students that might be um, having trouble, and can also coordinate uh, with the class, can interrupt everybody if he wants to uh, uh, present an example or discuss an example with the, with the class. So this gives the teacher control over this computer-mediated activity that's uh, very different from uh, what's been the case in the past. I mean, in, uh, in, uh, in, in typical computer-based learning applications, teachers feel that they don't get enough support for actually participating in the learning process. So these types of tools provide a way to accomplish that. Finally, uh, AI can be used not just uh, to deliver learning materials and manage learning activities, but can also play a role in the production process of creating learning content. Uh, because AI can, uh, machine learning in particular, can play a role in creating content from examples of learner data, uh, for updating content as needed. And in this approach, uh, content authoring becomes uh, more of a matter of training and retraining the AI models built into the content from learner data that is being collected along the way. And in fact, this is an approach that we um, utilize and have developed at Alelo, we call it uh, D3, or data-driven development process. So, so this is an approach to developing learning content which is highly iterative and informed by learner data. That actually the process starts with examples of learner data, which are mined to develop an understanding of the problems that learners face. They're used to uh, develop models built within the software, which are then deployed and, of course, at providing a learning experience to the learners, 
but at the same time are serving as a data collection tool to uh, collect more data, which is then used for more analysis and for model retraining. And so this then becomes highly iterative. In fact, we've developed a whole process with different types of tests and evaluation. So we are continually monitoring the performance of our learning systems with what we call instant tests that identify, you know, right now, how well is the system performing with learners? Uh, what we call snapshot evaluations, where we um, focus in on a particular group of learners for a limited period of time, and then evaluate in depth how um, um, uh, the learning process is working, combining multiple um, uh, data sources. So combining the data that the system itself is capturing together with surveys and interviews that provide a richer understanding of what's going on in the uh, learning process or to correlate with other types of assessments. And then we use regression tests to com, uh, compare the current version of the system uh, performance with uh, its performance on data that we've collected um, in, in the past. So we can understand how the system is evolving um, even as the system continues to um, collect more data from more learners. So these capabilities that I've talked about are individually useful, but where they really have transformative power is when they start to be combined, where we see multiple of these roles in a single learning system. So I'll give you uh, one example that we have been developing at Alela, we call uh, NSkill, um, which combines a number of AI-driven capabilities. First of all, it uh, uses natural language communication uh, as a medium for, um, uh, for practice. Uh, it conducts, uh, performs formative assessments continually as learners are interacting with the system. Uh, it provides feedback of different types at different phases in the learning process. It provides guidance uh, personalized learning of what activities uh, the learner can uh, perform next. And it generates analytics uh, that are provided back to the learners and which uh, we are uh, making available to teachers and to administrators, as well as to developers uh, of, of the system. So that the, um, the, the, base, the learning process becomes more data driven. And this, by the way, is a finalist for uh, the British Council's Award for Digital Innovation in English Language Teaching. Uh, the final award ceremony will be uh, in June of 2019, so wish us well. We look, are hoping to win that award overall. So this was, uh, there are five finalists. There were 150 entrants um, in 45 countries. So, so this is a pretty big um, competition here. I'll play a little bit of a video that introduces um, NSkill and its application at, uh, by Laureate International Universities, an international network of um, uh, higher ed institutions. Of the four language skills, language teachers agree that speaking is by far the most important. NSkill's artificial intelligence technology helps students improve their speaking skills and helps teachers teach more effectively. I'm going to New York. It helps me to improve my classes and also it makes my classes very, very short and very, very communicative. If you want your students to have more self-confidence, I let it want to be your best option. When I was a kid, I wish I had this kind of platform because it helps in the confidence and also it helps in my classes in English.
So I think there's you know, a couple of things to, to highlight there. So those teachers, they didn't talk about um, you know, the knowledge of English that students were learning. They were, they were commenting on um, how it helped the students develop self-confidence in speaking English. So they're reacting to its way it's addressing the, uh, the whole learner. And they comment how this makes their classroom activities better. So this is really what we, what we look to see, that the, that the uh, online learning activity complements and augments the, um, uh, the classroom activities and, and, and helps them to be more uh, effective. So give you a couple of, of here are a couple of screenshots to give as an example of how the different roles that I, I talked about uh, they uh, they play here. So so first of all, uh, learners interact with uh, and skill in spoken language. So they speak into a microphone uh, with a character on the computer. They're engaged in a task based conversation. So this is not open ended chit chat. This is conversation to perform a particular task. In this case, to buy a train ticket to New York. Um, it's important that it be task-based for, for a few reasons. First of all, uh, there are certain common tasks that are indicative of English proficiency at different levels. So if the student shows that they can master a particular task, and that provides evidence that they have achieved proficiency at a particular level. And then secondly, if we put the conversation in the context of a task, it makes it much easier for the system to assess uh, the learner's inputs, the learner's responses in terms of the relevance and appropriateness to, the, to those tasks. Um, also, so this has a natural language um, uh, understanding capability. Uh, that has some unique aspects. First of all, it is task-based. If you say something that is totally off topic, the character will say, sorry, I don't understand. Even though if it succeeded in transcribing what the learner said, if, it, if it's not relevant to the task, then it won't respond. So basically, the, um, the non-player character is implicitly providing feedback to encourage the learners to stay on task. And as long as a learner is able to do so, then the um, uh, system is able to interpret the learner's responses in part because it has an extensive library of common errors, which we collect from language learners around the word, world. So for example, here on the screen, one of the um, learner inputs was, I want to leave at first my. So, the, this illustrates uh, common errors in uh, common pronunciation error that we observe, um, people mispronouncing the word may as my, as well as uh, grammatical errors. So uh, getting the wrong uh, preposition here uh, to say I leave at first my instead of I leave, I uh, want to leave on May 1st. So, so this is a unique challenge for communication in this context to be able to understand uh, the learner's uh, intent, even if there are uh, errors, um, at, but at the same time be able to recognize those errors and respond uh, at the appropriate time. So in this type of system, uh, provide when and how to provide feedback is critical. One thing that we've learned is that if the system is immediately correcting grammar errors or pronunciation errors, then it stops becoming a stops being a conversation and becomes a grammar or pronunciation exercise. So, so the goal here first and foremost is to engage the learners in conversation give them help develop their self-confidence of their ability to engage in conversation but um, uh, to make note of errors in order to be able to provide feedback after the um, the conversation is done and that's done in a couple of different ways one by focusing in 
on particular uh, areas where the learner had difficulties. So like for example, student uh, you know, had problems asking questions about departure and arrival times of, of the trains. And also in terms of quantitative metrics uh, that show um, learners and um, instructors how learners are progressing. So we, we, we generate um, multiple measures here. Uh, we uh, generate an, an overall performance score or, or mastery score, which um, is really measuring the learner's progress toward fluent uh, conversation with a minimum of uh, errors, repetitions, hesitations. And we also look at the number of conversational exchanges per minute. Uh, we want that to see that improve, um, increasing over time. And also the total time spent. So we, we, we like to see learners um, uh, continuing to pras practice apply effort to continue to improve and then the process see that their actual uh, performance is um, uh, improving as a result. Uh, the system provides guidance of uh, what to work on next uh, but this isn't the learner has a choice they can have a cho they can either go back and um, practice the conversation again see if they can do better or maybe try saying uh, different things or the system can recommend specific practice exercises on the particular er areas where the learner experienced uh, difficulty but we give the learner um, a choice because um, they you know they, they we want to help them develop their own intuition of where they need to uh, practice and um, improve. Now, at the same time, the system is collecting all this data on what learners are saying. And, and this has a lot of potential for providing insight to um, instructors of, of what are the patterns of um, errors that their learners are making. And we see here some examples of some of those patterns. So, so in this particular exercise, um, the prompt was ask Ken how many bedrooms the apartment has and you see some of the different responses how many bedrooms the apartment has how many bedrooms have an apartment so 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 actually this is a type of question that a lot of intermediate level language of English learners have difficulty with because of the, the word order is different from an indicative sentence. And if, if an instructor wants to dig in more deeply, we, ha we capture all these speech recordings on the, in the cloud and actually can review them uh, if appropriate. So actually, let's look, listen to one of these now. How many bedrooms apartment have? Okay, so I bring this up um, to, to illustrate that um, the um, uh, so what you're seeing here is the automatically generated transcription, which is helpful, but it's also helpful in some cases to really listen to what the uh, learner said to get uh, get better insight as to. Um, why they were having difficulty. So this, I think, is one of the exciting aspects of, of these cloud-based learning systems is that the data, the learner data that is collected can be used in so many different ways. And you can see the potential for AI to apply to this data and um, develop greater insights into how uh, learners are performing. So let's talk then about the road ahead. We've talked about these seven different capabilities uh, uh, that AI can bring to education and training. Uh, so how are these likely to be manifested in the future? I think they're gonna be manifested in systems that combine multiple capabilities, 
not necessarily all of them, but certainly multiple capabilities. And they'll be emerging in, uh, in, a, in a few different types of systems. So first of all, uh, next generation personalized learning systems. So we talked about some of the limitations of the current personalized learning systems. Uh, I expect going forward that we're gonna see uh, personalized learning systems embrace some of these other applications of AI uh, to um, overcome the limitations and provide a richer learning experience and to support um, teachers. Uh, we're going to see these in the form of next generation assessments. This is you know, of increasing interest in the assessment community to as, uh, online assessments that don't simply provide a score, but provide feedback to learners and the learning process. And then finally, uh, as orchestration systems become more prevalent, we're going to see them to be increasingly assessment driven utilizing these automated assessments to make it that much easier for teachers to manage the learning process. So who are gonna be the organizations that lead the charge in this area? I, there, there are a few that I see. So first of all, in corporate learning, learning development departments, they're seeking data-driven transformation, seeking ways that they can make their training be driven more by data. Uh, so this, these types of combined systems are increasingly attractive to them. They're interested both in the, in, in the learning experience, but also getting data as evidence of that the training is effective. Uh, we see uh, uh, increasing demand from online schools who are seeking to scale. And, and this is for a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of online learning is frankly pretty boring and uh, uh, online schools want to make uh, the material more engaging. But, but in particular, we're looking for ways that to make the learning more effective and scalable while at the same time retaining the appropriate role for teachers. Uh, and we're also seeing the uh, demand for this in the area of online tutoring services. So we see this a lot in the, in the English language learning uh, arena. There are these online um, uh, tutoring services that basically link up, say, um, English learners in China with English tutors in North America. And what these companies are coming to recognize is that that is a very labor intensive process and are asking the question, well, can AI be used to augment the online tutor experience so that more um, students can be reached more economically using these online services? But anyway, anyway, these are some of the organizations that are leading in this area, but this, these types of combined systems, of course, have potential uh, throughout the education and training arena, which is why they have such, um, I think, great potential going forward. So um, that's the uh, end of my presentation. I'm happy to... Um, uh, answer any questions or Kurt, if you have some uh, questions you'd like to raise, let's uh, let's talk about them. Thanks. Uh, very nice. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, so folks out there, do you have any questions to start with? Go yes, ahead and type them in if you do, or you can speak them. Well, actually, their mics are turned off. So oh, okay, fine. All right. Uh, well, while I wait for some, you to type, um, I can ask a question or two. Sure. Um, okay, let's see. You mentioned uh, constructions of new tasks as a, um, a potential area for AI. Mm -hmm. And I can understand how a system could uh, assess the effectiveness of a task in the same way it affects the um, success of a student. Um, it's just you are aligning along tasks instead of mm -hmm. along students. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see uh, just using regular old assessment techniques for that. Um, 
And I, you also mentioned that you could collect airs online, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and that's a traditional activity as well. But what about actually constructing uh, new tasks for students? Uh, have you tried, do you see anybody working on that? Or have you guys tried well, anything like that? Well, so, so we're making a start in, in, in this area, and, and I think it is, that, that this is an area where I think that we're at, at very early stages. So, so the, so, so the first um, uh, challenge, if you will, is to um, provide tools so that, um, if you will, um, uh, content authors who have some training in this area can, can leverage um, uh, machine learning uh, tools. So basically, so that the, that the authoring activity um, increasingly involves um, data collection and curation and less of laborious um, authoring of, of prompts and responses. Uh, where, where I see interesting potential is putting, you know, these tools in the hands of teachers and students. I think one example that comes to my mind is the work, uh, the, the Betty's uh, brain uh, work at um, 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 at, at, at Vanderbilt. So there, um, students are creating their own little um, AI models, and and I think that that whole approach of use of of model creation as a learning process has a lot of interesting potential. We're just beginning to, uh, I think, mine the possibilities there. Okay, I have a question uh, from David uh, Sonnenschein. Mm -hmm. uh, any uh, examples specific to disabilities like autism, sight, or hearing? We're exploring AI with Sing and Speak for Kids, that's all in caps, right. finding that young children are responding well, yet parents and teachers need more support and reinforcement. So we've done some, uh, some exploratory work with uh, humanoid robots as um, a medium for uh, communication. And we, we got involved in using those as basically creating a virtual uh, companion for language learners. But uh, the folks that we work with at Robokind, they've actually found that the big area of, of application for them is the autism spectrum. That kids find that interacting with a virtual, ro you know, with a robotic companion is, is um, much less, um, uh, challenging for them than um, interacting with with real people. So, so, so I think that, it, it, in a way, it's analogous to to what we're seeing in the language learning area. Is that if uh, it, autistic kids, it, this this type of communication with a virtual character or a virtual robot, you know, or a robotic character, helps them build their self confidence, which is so important. Um, and then, secondly. Uh, just these robotic um, humanoid robots are just so engaging because they exploit our, our natural tendency to engage in nonverbal communication. It's really fascinating technology. Now those those robots are you know they're still the tech the 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 hardware still has some work to improve, but I, I see a lot of interesting potential there. Thank you. Um, in absence of typed in questions, I'll ask another one. Um, this has to do with your N-Skill uh, system. Uh, you mentioned that as a person is working through a scenario with uh, the agent, uh, you don't, they don't get any feedback. Uh, or, or minimal feedback. It's, it's subtle feedback, I would say, in, in terms of, say, sorry, uh, you know, I didn't understand, or, or just feedback in terms of, of understanding and responding, but but not form feedback. You're, you're quite right. Do they students then go through a debrief, debriefing afterwards, where they um, sort of can go over the conversation they just had and spot their own mistakes? Um, well, they so they do get a review of 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 which objectives they met and which they um, have not. Uh, but they don't yet get a chance uh, to actually review the dialogue transcript. And 
Um, as you might imagine, that's actually on our agenda of things to, um, uh, to incorporate, to improve there. I, I, I see a lot of that potential value in, in doing that, absolutely. I know that um, some of the multimedia people like Rich Mayer believe that seeing text at the same time you're trying to speak can get kind of uh, confusing. He has a cognitive load explanation. Mm -hmm. um, your, your presentation displayed the uh, type dialogue but do yeah. the students see that or not? Um, it depends. So, so what you uh, so a couple things that I should explain in the context of the, of those screenshots is that first of all, it had all the transcripts displayed uh, because they're screenshots, so that you can you know as a viewer can see what's going on. And then secondly, it was all taking place in English. So. In actual use, um, first of all, we set it to the um, the language of the you know, native language of the learner, and so what they're getting is a combination of uh, of English and in their native language. And then we actually um, um, we 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 turn off those transcripts, those hints unless the student particularly needs them. So that's really scaffolding that fades away as learners become more proficient. What we want them to do is when they become fully proficient is just, you know, there are no prompts and they're just engaged in this conversation with the agent. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, still no typed questions. So let me ask another one. Um, <clears throat> clearly natural language, uh, communication with an AI system is it will help if the goal is to learn how to communicate, which is which is the case with EndSkill. Um, with AutoTutor, the language is usage itself is not the end um, goal. Instead, it's to master physics or to learn math or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, in a series of studies, AutoTutor was compared to giving students the same problems, physics problems, mm -hmm. um, and um, in the control condition, the comparison condition, students typed in an essay, just like they do uh, with AutoTutor, which is their explanation for what's going on. And um, AutoTutor analyzes that essay and then conducts a dialogue with the student. In the control condition, nothing analyzed the essay. And instead of a dialogue, students were just presented with a nice essay written by a physicist. Mm -hmm. um, so in the control condition, they were active, just as active as they, almost as active as they were with AutoTutor in that they were thinking about this problem and typing in their own explanation. As it turns out, apparently that activity was sufficient for learning physics because the control condition did the same on, uh, had the same gain scores from pre to post test on physics as did the AutoTutor students. This was such a surprising result. This is work that I did with Art Grazer back in uh, the 2000s that uh, Art and I replicated this several times. Um, and every time we got the same pattern of results, which is adding the natural language did not improve over what we called the tan can text remediation. Mm -hmm. And so um, that suggests that maybe natural language communication has limits, um, but we don't know, but that was just one series of studies. Um, have you got any intuitions as to, I mean, you had a slide there about how natural language could be helpful. Uh, can you expand on uh, what kind of tasks it might be helpful for? So uh, based on the experience that, that we have, uh, I think it depends in part on the, um, the, the, the learners, um, the, the degree of progress toward mastery. So, so an, an analogous, um, um, you know, contrast that we see, and you know, I, I, I was, you know, saying disparaging things about, um, you know, multiple choice examples, but in fact, we find that for beginners, it's actually helpful sometimes to present examples of good things to say. They can learn from those. And so that, seems a little you know analogous to what you were talking about in terms of presenting learners with examples of of um of expert uh, explanations uh but i think what so so 
at least you know in in the domains we look at we want to see learners actually um, get to the point where they can apply those skills on their own and as that's the case then then I think uh, natural language understanding uh, plays um, you know is, is increasingly uh, uh, useful I think the other thing that we have to look at is how the um, interaction with the software impacts um, uh, the activity in the classroom. And I think you know, this is the case um, uh, throughout. So, uh, you know, in, in that video that I uh, showed there, the teachers were commenting on um, how interaction with Enskill helped their classes to be better. Um, and I don't know, Kurt, did you guys evaluate how classroom activities changed under those different conditions? I think that would be an interesting thing to look at. It would be, and yes, uh, we only did lab study. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right, probably, that in the early stages of uh, acquiring a skill, an example can be just as effective as practice. Mm -hmm. but perhaps later on, we have to remove the examples and make people do this stuff. Um, and then we, if they still need feedback, then we have to analyze it. Yeah, uh, I think I think that if you're at least when you know, we're talking about relying on prompts, that there's, if you will, a um, a um, a ceiling effect that that students can get pretty good at selecting a response or recognizing a good response, but that doesn't mean that they're good at being able to construct them on their own. So we want them to get to higher levels in the um, in the Bloom taxonomy, if you will. And that's where I think. Uh oh, just got email from Avron who said he was locked out. Um, let's see if he had posted anything in email. Hang on. Uh, today's okay. I was going to. He wants to know who would be creating these multi AI learning environments at scale. Today's instructional designers would need a lot of help. <laughs> yeah, that's that. This is true. Uh, so, so I think there are the couple things, which is that you know we're, we're, what we're going to see is is development platforms in which some of these capabilities are built in, uh, and also that they leverage other cloud-based um, learning capabilities. I, you know what I what. I, I, a couple of trends that I see here. One is that there's um, you know, movement toward interoperability in online learning capabilities. So that, that that's one way of getting the combined um, um, uh, capability we're, lo we're looking for. And, and also leveraging other, um, uh, uh, other cloud-based, what are known as cognitive services. So for example, Enskill, makes use of other cloud-based speech and language technology. We, we, um, we basically took stuff which was there and then adapted it for educational purposes. So, so we're seeing less of, of systems having to be constructed from scratch. Now that certainly um, leaves open questions of how, uh, you know, how instructional designers are going to have to, um, you know, how they're going to use these technologies. And I think more fundamentally, you know, that requires a, a different type of thinking of how instructional design takes place. I mean, in, from our own perspective, we, you know, had to come around to recognize that really data is an important work product as much as the learning system itself. And I think it may take a little while for instructional designers to come to that realization. But I think as um, organizations and, and including um, development organizations are increasingly data driven, I think things will naturally move in that direction. Well, we're at the top of the hour, actually a little past it. So. Okay. Let's... Yeah, I think, I think we're good for now then. So, um, Thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, as um, you know, as I indicated, this is uh, the um, last of the uh, webinars for this season. We're going to let people go on summer break. Uh, but if anybody has 
um, thoughts of topics that they you know, have further questions about that they would like to see further exploration of in terms of uh, the present or future role of AI in education and training, uh, feel free to contact me. You see my uh, email address shown there, and then we'll um, pick up in the fall and continue uh, this, um, uh, this uh, discussion. So thanks everybody for participating. And, and also, if you haven't done so already, check out some of the other webinars. They're all on YouTube. Uh, you'll learn a lot by viewing them. So thanks everybody, uh, signing off for now.